Good evening, everybody. Good night. Or, no, good evening, I think, is what you say when you say hello. Talking Dirty with Maestro. Maestro. Not just numbers. Not just stats. It's, it's about, about what, what they mean. mean. Maestro. <laughs> We're gonna throw this into a movie. See, is that better for you? Educate me. I'm going to send you the information. Talking dirty. Welcome to your book. Me. Just going to hop right into it. Had to fly commercial this time. They're detailing the jet. Something about a smell or smells. I think it was plural. But it was cool. Got a chance to go back to one of my old stomping grounds, Ventura, California. My law school is there. Got a chance to hang out with some of my old professors, catch up on some good sushi, hit the beach. Really nice. And caught a good run. A run that had a lot of good players, and I thought it was so interesting that I got this run in after a conversation about East Coast, West Coast basketball prep recruits. There was a lot of talent on the floor. There's a lot of talent in Simro hoops anyway, but there were a lot of there was a lot of talent on the floor, and it was really nice to see. And it sort of made me rewire how I look at these runs now because I feel like I've been doing a disservice and not talking from, in some cases, a place of need for certain players. One player that really caught my eye, really active, super strong in his presence in the game, and that was 6'6", 197 pounds, C.J. Rodman. I really liked how active this young man was. He was always moving to the post. Always move into the post with intention, except for on the offensive side. I'm going to talk about that later. But his willingness to move to the ball, his willingness to be strong help side D as well as strong, strong side D showed in the fact that he got so many sneaky blocks and steals because of his great hands, which tells me he has great anticipatory power and vision. Super mega plus for a mid big. Yes, I'm going to call cats between the 6'6 to 6'9 range my mid bigs because he played like it for sure. So CJ, you're going to get credit for this one. Outside of his willingness to move, sometimes he got in trouble with that because his willingness to move, especially through the paint, moved him into traffic. However, I'll take it because I didn't see that as his fault. I saw that as a byproduct of there were many times in this run where there was just very poor space choices in the paint. At some points during the run, there would be four players from one side in the paint on offense and three players on defense in the same spot because you don't need all four to defend people who are that close together. And poor shots were made because of it. Despite that, what CJ was able to do, and I'm not calling him CJ out of disrespect. I know I do not know him. I hope he knows that I'm not being disrespectful when I call him CJ. What was really cool about what he did was he would still move into the traffic, carve out a spot, and then be effective for the outcome of the play. That is IQ. That's what you want to see because it tells me that this is a player who knows where to be when the ball's going to be there. If there was one need I would say for him is when he cuts through the paint on the offensive side of the ball, that he moves through the paint with intention. Hand up, looking for the pass, not just looking at the spot that he's going to run to. Why do I say that? Because on the defensive side, he would not just get the block, he'd get the rebound, he'd start pushing the ball up the floor, just what you'd want to see a mid-big do. Or he'd get the steal. He would look for the outlet briefly. Then if the outlet was not there, he would make the cut with the ball. 
If the outlet was there, it was a very effective pass every single time leading his teammate the way you'd want to lead your teammate. That tells me a lot about his IQ and his willingness to be that support mechanism. And y'all know where I'm going to go with this. What did I say? Rebounds, points, assists, blocks, steals. Stay with me. Dirty, dirty. Going to be a dirty, dirty for us. I guarantee going to tee it. And I haven't guaranteed going to tee anything since I've been in Simro Hoops. But looking at where his game is, I definitely see that happening. And more importantly, if he works on that, moving through the paint on the offensive side, not being so deferential when he's on the offensive side. I know he was giving room for his teammates. He had a lot of teammates that had pure offensive thoughts on their brain, and some of them should not have. He was still willing to defer to give them an opportunity before he acted. I really liked that. Transparency alert, probably because that's the way I play too. Shows me a player who's willing to do everything for his team at any given point and willing to get the job done. Really like seeing that happen. C.J. Rodman, please keep your eye on this kid. He's going to be something special. I guarantee you that right now. That was a, I guarantee it again. Y'all know I don't guarantee, but I'm guaranteed again. He's going to be something special for somebody. Hold this tape. C.J., you and me together, kiddo. Let's make this happen. Thank you for checking out this half of the episode. See you on the other side. Thank you for, for listening, listening to, to Maestro. Maestro. Want to get involved? Bring, Bring it. it. Drop in discord.gg slash simworldnba. If, if you, you have, have the brain, brain, join as a coach. If, if you, you have, have the game, game, join as a player. Seize the game, game. Be, be the, the game. game. Now, back, back to, to Maestro. Maestro. Sorry, we'll be right back. Okay, we're back. <laughs> and welcome back to this episode. Let's talk about drills. Started this conversation a little while back. And let's talk about one drill that I truly, truly enjoy because of all the various things that it teaches. And that is a three on two, two on one drill. And for those who might not know it, I'm. I won't make an assumption that everyone does. This is a drill where you have three players bringing the ball up the floor. They're being defended by two. The two players will have to work in tandem defense form in order to get a stop. Now, if the three bringing the ball up score, then we reset. But if there is a stop, the two defensive players will then take the ball, they transition on offense, and the last person to touch the basketball or the furthest person back, depending on what the coach wants, will then act on defense. So it becomes two on one. And that person has to find a way to play single tandem defense. I know that's oxymoronic. To guard between ball and man to get a stop of the other two. It's also an opportunity for the two bringing the ball up with two on one to get used to spacing, drill, timing, and things like that. When I talk about those shots, those two consecutive years in the state championship game, this was the very situation that we were faced. It was three on two. We we're bringing the ball up. We we're being defended by two. Both times, the same school assumed we were going to call a timeout, and we didn't, neither year. You guys know the outcome. One year, we lost the championship, one point. Next year, we won the championship, one point. But the exact same situation, three on two. And this drill is three on two that becomes two on one. What is important about this drill? How can one player guard two? You have to make a tactical decision between ball progress and man progress. Here's what I normally see. When it's two on one, the player without the ball tends to stay in the same gravitational line as his teammate or her teammate with the ball and the defensive player. Instead of flaring out 
wide to then go to the rim. It sounds so simple, but for some reason, no matter how many times we would say this as coaches, players won't tend to do it. And I would do my thing about leverage and understanding space. On the three on two drill, you want your wing players to flare out as much as possible, reverse wing formation. The two defenders then have to make a decision. The front defender, always hesitating ball. Notice I didn't say stop ball. Hesitating ball, which means what? I become an impediment more so than a fence. I make sure that I'm slowing down that progress. I'm forcing the two players on the wing to make a move. As the second tandem defensive person, I then look to see who is in front position, left or right. I then position myself so I can see both players. So I don't have to turn. I can see both players and I can see ball and I can see which way is the ball going to go. Why am I doing that? I'm hoping my man will now force the person bringing the ball up to pass one way or the other. As the ball is in the air, I start to move. And if I time it right, it's a steal. If I don't time it right, I meet the player with the ball. I then become on ball defender while my teammate now flares back, keep anyone from cutting through becomes the impediment in the middle of the floor, always hands up. So this drill, the three on two, two on one drill, is one where you can teach so many concepts. And as players, you can learn so many concepts that it becomes completely irreplaceable as you try to develop your skills throughout this process. And the best part about it it's going to be different every time. Sometimes on the three on two drill, the three bringing it up. If I'm bringing the ball up, I might push one of my sides, go to the rim. Don't worry about it. Go to the rim. Why? I want to unstable the two that are in front of me, right? I want to force the second person in tandem to commit to keeping you from the rim. In doing so, what do I do? I kick it to the opposite side player forcing somebody to make a decision about that player while I then flash to mid post, flash to high post, or even if my player flashed all the way through dragging the defender with him, guess what? Backside alley-oop, all good, Range Rover, all wood. That is just how you can make this particular drill work across the table. So many different things we could probably do an entire series just on this particular drill, how to approach it, how to go about it. But I'm going to guarantee something. So many of my old heads who've heard the previous talks about how to handle zone versus man defense, offensive leverage versus this. If you put those principles here, a lot of things will now make sense to you. So hopefully this helped you look at this drill a little bit differently. If you haven't done it or have not done it a lot, hopefully this reinvigorates you to want to do it more and make you a little bit better, kind of like how I want to be. Thank you so much for checking this out. Thank you so much for your feedback. Again, I'll ask, what other drills you want to hear about? What other techniques would you like to hear about? We, this is our ship together. Remember, this is about us. I would not be doing this without you. So give your boy some feedback. Give your boy what up. Let's work together. You're supposed to be a team, right? Then let's act like it. And to everybody who don't know us, I'm just going to say it like this. Now we got to fight all y'all. Like I need to talk to somebody. Thank you for listening to Maestro. Thank you again for checking out Maestro. Drop a tag below and give us a piece of your mind. See you next time. Well, thank you for your time. Have a wonderful day.